run through the techniques used in the Tempestry project. And this is something that I learned about when my audio podcast co-host, Casey, she interviewed the folks from the Tempestry project and um, I got pretty excited about the whole thing. And I was knitting my own Tempestries and posting them online as I was knitting them and getting a lot of questions about how to work it, the trickier parts of the, the Tempestry. And a little bit about this project. I've been calling it a knit along art project. And Tempestry, they, tempestries are temperature tapestries. And if you've heard of uh, temperature blankets or temperature scarves where you knit a different color for different temperatures, um, different days, this is kind of the same thing. The difference is that we have some standards that we're all using so that we're using the same kind of yarn, the same colors of yarn, the same color chart for the different temperatures so that when you look at two tempestries, you're comparing apples to apples. You, know, you look at an Alaska tempestry and an Arizona tempestry and you're going to see different colors, but the, the similarities are there as far as the colors that are being used for the different temperatures. And I'm really excited about this project and the social media around it and how people are getting involved. And so that's why I wanted to do this video because there are a few, I mean, not super tricky things. As soon as I explain it, you'll understand. But Emily, Justin, and Marissa, they are the people behind the Tempestry Project, and they're working really hard, and they speak really passionately about this project. And I'll give you a link here to the podcast, the audio podcast where Casey interviewed them. That, that got, is what got me excited about this. Now, people are using Tempestries for different things. You know, they're knitting... Um, maybe the year they were born, the year their kids were born, the year they got married. In my tempestries, we can go ahead and cut away to a picture of my tempestries on my fireplace. I knit Austin, Texas, 1900 and 2017. And I actually did this to demonstrate climate change because Austin is quite a bit hotter than it was 117 years ago. And we can show the second picture of my tempestries blocking kind of for a close-up look. And this is just one way. I wanted to, well, I was kind of excited about my Austin tempestries against the Austin limestone of my fireplace. I think it looks really good. I get a lot of compliments on it. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how I hung them to, um, to hang like that. I have so many things to say about this project. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to spit it all out and remember. Um, you can choose to knit or crochet. I'm going to demonstrate the linen stitch here. And um, you can also just use garter stitch. I think linen stitch has a little more hold to it. It's not going to sag when it hangs. That's why I was looking forward to it. And there are different ways that you can um, participate with the Tempestry project. Now, the pattern is free. Click the little I in the upper right hand corner to go to my website for all the links that I'm going to talk about here. The pattern is free and you can just get your pattern and your yarn and start knitting. And, uh, but if you would actually like a color card, let me find one here. This is actually really handy. Um, you can order these for just a few bucks from the Tempestry Project Etsy store and I find that I refer to, I hold my ball of yarn up to the color card all the time because the such tiny changes in color with some of it that it, it is really helpful. So you can, you can just get your pattern and do your own thing or you can get a color card from the Tempestry Project or you can actually get a kit. And the yarn that they chose to use is Knit Picks Wool of the Andes for a couple of reasons. One is that they have a lot of colors that don't change. The other reason is that it's a nice yarn and it's at a good price. And even if you live, no matter where you live in the world, the Tempestry Project can put together your information and send you a kit, you know, provided there is data on the city and year that you're looking for. Um, but I think it's actually a really convenient and economical way to go because they will send you itty bitty balls of yarn for colors that you don't need much of and then much bigger balls of yarn for colors that you use a lot of. And this kit here is a deluxe kit. It is for my hometown of Kodiak, Alaska. And so I have a lot of blues and greens in here that you didn't see in my Austin kits because it's much colder there, right? And I wanna show you what comes in a deluxe kit. I have all my yarn. I have my, oh, some needles, some knitting needles a beading hook because you have the option of adding beads for precipitation and beads and then a needle wrangler which is a kind of a uh, stitch holder to keep the stitches from sliding off your needles and then the really the really important thing the thing that is very cool that the Tempestry project is putting together are the instructions 
Um, they give you instructions for knitting, but most importantly, they give you this, um, this spreadsheet that gives you the date. You, know, you, you can uh, order the date and the city that you want, and then they'll, they'll see if they can get the data for you. It gives you the date, the temperature, and the exact color of yarn to use for that row. So it's just like following any other knitting pattern, and you don't have to do the research yourself. They're the ones that are actually doing the research, and I'll tell you what, I gave them the challenge of finding Kodiak, Alaska, 1900 and 19, uh, 2017. 2017 is, of course, easy, but Kodiak wasn't even part of America back in 1900, but they ended up getting me, I think, did they get me 19? Now I can't remember if they got me 1900 or 1917. It's on my project. I'll have to just take a look. So this is the deluxe kit that comes with beads and tapestry needles and yarn, but you can just get the kit with the instructions and the yarn, or you can just get the color card, you can just, or you can just get the instructions downloaded for free from Ravelry, whatever you choose. It's really fun, and I hope more people participate. So I think I said all the things. No, 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 there's something really exciting. Emily, Justin, and Marissa were just accepted into the Creative Climate Awards. They're getting on a a plane um, to go to the Creative Climate Awards. It's uh, awards to broaden climate conversation, and they're, they were accepted for this year, 2018, for the tempestries that they did for Utkiavik, Alaska. And I, I looked this up to get the pronunciation and realized, hey, that's Barrow, Alaska. They just changed the name of Barrow, Alaska to Utkiavik. Anyway, I learned something new. Okay, we are going to get started. I said all the things, and this part was really long, but we're ready to get started on the knitting. Next. Okay, we are ready to get started with the knitting, and I'm going to be demonstrating this with the linen stitch, and it is necessary to use circular needles, which doesn't really make sense for a flat piece, but we're going to be working sometimes two right side rows in a row, which will make sense. I was trying to explain this on Facebook and no one understood what I was saying. So that's why I'm making this video so that you guys can understand why we need circular needles for this project. Let's go ahead and take a look. Here we are with my little working piece and I'm just kind of making things up as I go along here for colors for demonstration um, because this is not the piece that I'm working on for Kodiak. I have my linen stitch going on and I have beads here which we're going to talk about in the next section but first up I want to look at the chart and this is what the tempestry project sent me and I have the day number here the date the high temp for that day and in this chart because I I'm doing beads it gives me the precipitation for that day the color of the yarn to use and then it tells me um, if there is precip precipitation it tells me exactly how many and which color of beads to use but we don't get into that until down here a little bit okay the so you just read across like a regular knitting chart telling you exactly which color to use for which day the thing I want to show you here is that like three days in a row here January 6 through 8 we have the same color tranquil 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 because the the temperature just changes a little bit also in the tempestry project, each color represents four degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a really tiny window before you get to another color. So three colors the same over three days. That's three rows of knitting. And then we switch um, to another color, another color. And then we're back to that tranquil color here. Now, the reason I mentioned this is because we're going to do three rows and then change. And we're going to get back to this color. And so you want to make a decision as to whether you're going to carry those colors are not up the side. You're going to break the yarn and reattach it. So let's go ahead and look at the linen stitch on right side and wrong side rows and why we're using circular needles. Okay. I have two colors of yarn attached here because in this sample that I'm kind of making up the colors and the days, I'm, I'm switching back and forth between these two colors, so I'm keeping them both attached. So in this one, I'm going to go back to the green, which is called Green Tea Heather. And I w I'm going to, um, because I'm going to keep carrying this yellow color, I'm going to pull the green from, front, from back to front like this. And my first three stitches are garter stitch border. I'm going to knit them. And then I'm going to get into the, garter st or the linen stitch. Now, this first stitch that I see has 
a carry in front of it, a slip stitch shows me that this was slipped on the last row. So if it was slipped on the last row, I want to knit it this time. And then the next stitch does not have a slip in front of it, so I do want to slip the stitch this time. I'm going to yarn forward and always carry the yarn in front when I slip. Well, that's the pattern. Um, this is the pattern for linen stitches too. On the right side, knit one, yarn forward, slip one, knit one, yarn forward, slip one. And that's how we get this cool little V's and dashes look of the linen stitch on the front of the work because all of the yarn is carried on the front when you slip. Knit one, yarn forward, slip one. Now if um, I put the work down because the phone rang or someone's at the door or something, I pick it back up, I'm not sure where I am, I just take a look and I see that there's a slip stitch he right here um, uh, from the row below. So since it was slipped last time, I'm going to knit it this time. Now this is important because you're gonna be working, like I said, a couple of wrong side rows in a row or right side rows in a row, and we'll get to that in just a minute. And it's the reason we need circular needles. It's really important to be able to read your work, to see where you are, to see what's coming next, because every row is still just knitting or purling and slipping, but it isn't always clear um, what's coming next until you have a look. I'm going to finish this row so I can make up a new scenario of, and explain why we're using circular needles for a flat piece. And I have my garter stitch border here, so I'm going to knit these last three stitches. Okay, now normally if you're working a flat piece like a scarf or something, you're going to turn the work and work a wrong side row. But remember I have this yellow yarn attached over here? This is my next color. This is the color I need to use for our next day. I just worked a right side row. I'm going to work a second right side row. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm going to slide my work down to the other end of the needle. This is why we're using circulars and work another right side row. Let me get myself straightened out here. And because I'm working a garter stitch border and garter stitch is um, knitting every, every uh, row when you're turning the work, you know, front and back, I actually need to purl these to maintain the garter stitch border. And if you look, you see there are, are little V's under the, the stitch on the needle. That means knit. If it has a little scarf around its neck, that's purl. These are V's, so I'm going to purl these stitches to maintain the garter stitch border. And then I look and I see a V. This stitch was knit last time. I can actually, it was just a minute ago, I just knit, knit this stitch last time I remember, so I want to slip it this time. So with the yarn in front, I slip and knit. Yarn forward to slip. So that explains why we're using circular needles and when you're, um, when you're carrying multiple colors of yarn, the yarn color that you need for the next row, the next day of knitting, might mean that you work two right side rows um, back to back or two wrong side rows back to back. Um, and if you're carrying more than two colors, I imagine that you can work three or more right side or wrong side rows back to back. It just becomes important to be able to read your knitting so that you uh, can just see what's coming next. Just be ready for it. And after you've worked a few rows, you'll, you'll get a feel for it. And I'll tell you, when I'm carrying colors, I will usually carry a color for, hmm, you know, maximum of maybe four or five rows before I just break the yarn to reattach it. Okay, again, I'm going to, I'm going to use the green yarn again. So I want to carry this yellow color. I am going to pretend that I have this yellow color coming up again. I'm going to wrap the green and the yellow to, together to carry that yellow that I'm not using up the work a little bit. Let me see here. I'm going to purl these stitches to maintain the garter stitch border. 
and I've caught the yellow yarn up in the green yarn. And to work the wrong side row, I take a look. This was purled last time, and if it's, it's kind of confusing from the back of the work. I always kind of do this and look at it, and I see that it was knit last time. So I want to slip the stitch this time. So I yarn back to slip the stitch because we always want the slip stitch to, to show up on the, on the front of the work, the right side of the work. So I yarn back and slip, yarn forward and purl. Back, purl, back to slip, forward to purl. And this is the wrong side row. And the wrong side of the work kind of just looks like pearl bumps. Everything's pretty, I think it's a lot more exciting on the right side of the work. Okay, that's how to work the linen stitch on both the wrong and right side of the work. You really just have to see what you did last time from where your working yarn is coming from, your next color, whatever, and then just kind of work with what you have from there. So you might be sliding things to other ends of the needles or, you know, purling your garter stitch border, whatever. I hope, I hope that explains all of it. Up next, we are going to talk about beading for showing um, the amount of rainfall or snowfall in a day and what I'm calling a rag rug fringe on the edges of the work so you don't have to weave in all those ends. Okay, this last section, we are ready to do the last few things on this project. I'm gonna show you how to add beads, if that's something that you choose to do. And I'm gonna show you um, two things that I kind of put together, um, people have been asking me questions about my own tempestries, and these are two things that I did in mine. You know, the, the, the instructions you get are kind of a guide for you, kind of a recipe, and you can work within those to do your thing. I did a rag rug fringe, is what I'm calling it, to avoid having to weave in a bunch of ends, and because weaving in a lot of ends, you know, even if I did the patience for it, it can leave the work looking rippled and not as even as I wanted. So I kind of put together this way of doing it instead. And I'm gonna show you that and also what I did to hang mine. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. The first thing we're gonna do is a beading. Okay, we're back on our little sample piece here. And the last few rows that I did there uh, for a demonstration to show you, we're gonna go ahead and pretend that there was just no rain on those days. And you'll follow your pattern um, you follow your uh, spreadsheet to show you exactly what, how many beads to use and what colors because you will get two colors of beads, aqua and clear, and, and they demonstrate different amounts of rain. So it'll say, you know, use w w one aqua and four clear, whatever. I'm going to show you how to do that. So I'm going to purl the first three stitches to maintain the garter stitch, as we discussed in the last section. And then the beads are always added over here on the left side, the beginning of, of the right side row, and you always want to add them to a knit stitch, not a slip stitch. So I'm going to slip this first stitch and then knit the next one. And I want to add a bead to this, so I knit it and I'm going to slip it back over to this needle, so because I'm going to work it here. Now the um, Tempestry Project, they actually give you a link to a video that demonstrates beading, you know, for, for help with beading. I think it's in the instructions. They demonstrate beading, um, whoever did the video, I can, I'm sorry, I can't remember who, they demonstrate beading, adding the bead to the row below. Like, I'm going to knit it first because I want the bead to appear on this row that I'm knitting now because that's the temperature I'm knitting, that's the day I'm knitting. And I have my, um, teeny tiny crochet hook, my beading hook that came with my deluxe kit, and I have a little bowl of beads. I'm going to pick up a bead. It's good to have a little rounded bowl like this. And put the little crochet hook on the stitch, and then slide the bead through onto like the, whoops, onto the base of the stitch. And then put that stitch back up on the left needle and tighten it up. I'm going to slip the next stitch and knit the next stitch 
and I'll do that beading trick one more time. Take my little hook, grab a bead, hook that stitch with the hook and then slide the bead onto the stitch. Now what, I've, what happened here is that the stitch split. That's okay. Just keep pulling the bead and eventually the stitch will pull itself back together and then get it up on the needle. Okay, that's how you're going to work adding the beads. And you can see it ends up looking pretty cool. It's like a little sparkle in your sparkle in your tempestry that's actually demonstrating something about the weather that day. Now I just slipped those stitches back over because I want to demonstrate what I'm calling the rag rug fringe. You know what I should do is, I didn't have this ready, but I can have it ready here in just a second. For a close-up of the rag rug fringe, this is my Kodiak 1900, or I guess I, I can't remember if it's 1900 or 1917 that I've been working on. And here is what the rag rug fringe looks like. And I did the same thing on my Austin ones hanging on the wall. It is, um, I don't know, I like the way it looks. Here it is, it shows up more here. Okay, that was for a close-up look. I just made a mess of everything pulling that out. Okay, so I'm ready to do it here with these ends. And all I'm going to do is tie these ends in a double knot. But a couple things I want to remember. One is to give that piece a tug. The edge stitches get pretty loose. I like to pinch the garter stitch border and pull. And sometimes I end up getting a lot of yarn out of there. Once I've done that, I just tie a little knot, a double knot and then however long I want to leave it, I guess I'm leaving it like three quarters of an inch, just cut it short. Then move on to the next, giving it a tug, tie them together. And cut it short. And the, the ends look really kind of pokey right now, but they, they end up coming unraveled a little bit. You, you saw what mine looked like. I think they end up looking pretty cool. So this one I'm not going to cut short because I have this lonely one here that needs something to tie to. So I'm going to take a tapestry needle and one of those ends, I tied those two together and now I'm going to run this end on the back of the work close to that lonely one, it's kind of in an end desert, to give me something to tie onto. And there we go. And now I can cut all three. Okay, the last thing I'll show you is that you might end up with a section that doesn't really have any ends to weave in, like this section right here, what I just did. If you want ends to weave in, you can always just take the ends that you cut and attach them. You can have a little rag run, rug fringe running all the way down the side if you don't want to have gaps. And there were a couple of sections where I didn't like the way the edge looked, like I didn't tighten a stitch all the way or something. So I just attached a little, a little fringe like this and it's all covered up and <laughs> nobody was the wiser. Except for I just told you. So now you are. Okay, this is what I did to hang mine. I, you saw the picture of my Austin tempestries hanging over my fireplace. And I bought a quilt rod on Etsy. I had a custom made quilt rod. And I'll be sure to give you a link to the, the vendor that I used for that. But in order to get it to hang on the, the quilt rod, I made a little sleeve on the back of the work with some ribbon. This is actually twill tape. And what you do is you cut a piece as long as, you know, a little shorter than the width of your tempestry and just use a regular needle and thread and just whip stitch it down 
without poking all the way through the tempestry. Just grab little bits of yarn and make a sleeve and then you can slide a dowel in. And then you can hang, um, use more of the twill tape or ribbon to make little loops to hang it and attach them to what you already have. You can, you'll slide that in and that will keep the tempestry from sagging in the middle when it's hung. Because I, I thought that the linen stitch was going to be strong enough to keep it from sagging in the middle, but when I, when I tried it before I put the sleeve in the back, it did sag in the middle. So this is what I did to make it really straight, except for that's not straight the way I'm holding it right there. Stitch it down like that um, and add those, uh, those loops and then I just slid them onto the quilt rod. Oh, and I bought these, these dowels and I was trying to think, oh, do I have a little saw to cut them? And I just went to my garage and got my pruning shears and <laughs> I figured it's like a little branch. It was, it cut just like a little branch. Brilliant. I didn't need a special saw. I had my pruning shears. Okay, those are all the techniques that I can think of um, that I used when I was knitting my tempestries, my first two tempestries, now I'm knitting Alaska. Um, many thanks to the folks behind the project for letting me do this tutorial for them. I'm happy to raise awareness about it. It's really fun. I hope you, uh, if you participate, that you get involved with the social media as well. There's a really active Facebook group that I'm a part of and I love seeing people's tempestries. I do want to say one of the things that I love is that I'm knitting Alaska and I already knit Austin, so I I used oranges and reds and then I used a lot of I'm using a lot of blues right now in my Austin ones and uh, my Alaska ones and there are people who live in places like Minnesota they're using all the colors in the color card because Minnesota has freezing winters and really hot summers and they're knitting all the colors and I'm so jealous I might move there just so I can knit the tempestries anyway it is a lot of fun I hope to see you in some of the social media groups for this good luck